silence. Silence is complicity in the face of injustice. This is what our world has been screaming at us lately. Everyone wants you to say something. The problem is no one agrees on what to say. And that can be exhausting. It's tempting to think we're unique in this. That in the scope of history, it's only getting worse. But it's just not true. Jesus also lived in a politically tumultuous context. Instead of two parties fighting, he had four. Instead of one government fighting itself, he had two fighting each other. And it seems that the more Jesus rose in popularity, the more he was hunted, entrapped, conspired against. Sometimes he avoided confrontation, but sometimes he walked straight into it. Sometimes it seems like the more people wanted to know what he had to say, the less he said. What does that mean for me? If I can't find a pattern, how do I set a code to live by? How, how do I boil my life philosophy down to three easy steps or a tweetable hashtag? Jesus was silent in the face of his own injustice. Every step he took, every word he said or didn't say, walked him right to the cross. What kind of love is that? I don't know about you, but that silence gets me. And the fact that Jesus was silent when he could have spoken up, when he could have gotten himself out of the crucifixion, when he could have said, I, I did or I didn't do whatever you're saying that I did or didn't do. He, he could have talked himself out of it like he had countless other times. He could have. He wasn't trapped, right? The chains that held him, the handcuffs. Imagine handcuffing the son of God. It's like handcuffing Superman. But what's, what is even the point, right? How, what could that possibly accomplish? There were countless situations before the crucifixion that Jesus could have been killed, but wasn't. And remember the time the people from his hometown wanted to throw him off a cliff, got him to the cliff, and then he just slipped away. <laughs> the times when the teachers of religious law would try to trap him with words so the crowd would do their evil for them. <clears throat> and he talked his way out of it every time. He slipped out of the crowds miraculously, or he talked his way out, because however wise Solomon was, Jesus was a hundred times that, infinitely more than that. But not at the end. It's not as if he didn't know. He knew he was walking to that cross. He knew the night before 
in that garden. And he told those three disciples that he brought with him that his soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And he asked them to stay up and keep watch with him. Do you remember this story? Matthew 26. Stay up. Keep watch with me. Pray with me. My soul is crushed to the point of death. Did they? No. Silence. They were sleeping. He even told them the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I need your help to pray. He knew full well what was coming. He even begged God. And somehow that's comforting for me to know. And even Jesus, the son of God, he, he begged, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. But ultimately let your will be done. If it's possible, if there's any other way, God, take this cup from me. But did God answer? As far as we can tell, no. Silence. I mean, look again, Matthew 26, read it on the way home today. We see no answer from God. Does that strike anyone else as odd and maybe even a little cruel? Right, that messes with my theology a little bit for some reason. Like we expect God to answer in our anguish. After all, the Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted, right? That he, that he comforts those who mourn, that he leads us by quiet waters. But when I look back through those, quiet waters, he's close. Comfort, comfort isn't always verbal, is it? Through this silent series, I'm noticing little details I never noticed before. I, I always expect God to answer when I call, but I expect him to answer verbally. I, I want words. I want you to, to be very clear and direct, God, right? And I want you to answer verbally. I think that's a, an important distinction because I expect him to answer verbally, but sometimes he answers Non-verbally. In fact, I now think more often than not, he answers non-verbally. God answers in the silence. So he's close. But he's not necessarily talkative. (laughs) See, that's frustrating to those of us with control issues. Right? Anybody else? Is it just me? It's a little frustrating because I want answers. We want answers, right? And we would like them now. If not sooner, I'd like them yesterday. I'd like you to answer my questions before I even have them, God. Why? It's usually my question. Why, God? Or how, God? Or or when, God? Or especially why, again? Why, God? I want the answers. And it's comforting to me to know that Jesus had questions, too. In this case, his questions seem to be, is there any other way? Is there any other way? And yet God was silent. And it's important to watch Jesus here. Important to watch his response to silence from God. Because you can imagine, he, he withdrew constantly to talk to God. You can imagine that he's used to some back and forth with his father. He's used to answers, probably. It's important to watch him here. When God is silent, his bros off in the garden, they're silent too. They're sleeping. Maybe they're not silent. They're snoring. They're not saying anything. They're certainly not praying. The people closest to him let him down. Sleeping on the job. Literally, but also spiritually. (laughs) Even when he told them he was hurting. Crushed to the point of death. Anybody been crushed with grief? To the point of death. Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus feels those feelings too? Crushed to the point of death and still his friends slept. Selfishly. They chose 
physical comfort over spiritual work assigned to them by Jesus himself, their creator himself. They chose physical comfort over spiritual work. And even more interestingly, they chose physical proximity over spiritual proximity. Track with me here. They chose physical proximity over spiritual proximity. They were physically there with Jesus, yes, but they were miles away from his heart. This is where I think a lot of the church is right now. A lot of us as Christians, we, we may be in church again. We're close physically, but we're still missing his heart. The heart of Jesus, miles away from his heart. We can be saying all the right things, have all the right words, Jesus' words, and yet we, if we say them without his heart behind them, we're still wrong. They were physically close to Jesus, sure. They were included in the last night before his arrest but still miles away from his heart. And Jesus, although obviously frustrated by their sleeping, he confronts them three separate times about it. He doesn't focus on it. He doesn't allow his mission to be thwarted. He doesn't allow it to get him off track. He goes back into the arms of his father, confronts people, stay up. Come on, guys, get up, pray with me. This is for you as much as it is, as it is for me. And he tells Peter, maybe you'll be able to withstand what comes next if you stay up and pray. But he goes back to his father every time. And even though his father doesn't answer, he knows he's close. Jesus follows orders. He goes back to the mission. He trusts God. This is what actual trust of God looks like. He, he trusts him fully, perfectly, completely, and totally surrendered, even though he's scared and hurting and he's dreading every minute of what comes next. He still does it. He knew exactly what he was walking into. He went to that cross knowingly. He laid down his life. It wasn't taken from him. He laid it down down. And he did that for you, for me. Even though I sleep when I shouldn't, even though I choose physical comfort over spiritual assignment sometimes, and even though I disregard his laws written for my own benefit, even though I'm selfish, I do things I know I shouldn't do, and I don't do things I know I should do. He still did that for me, for you. Because of what he did at the cross, the assignment he chose to follow that night, the point of no return, Satan, our accuser, is now the one who has to be silent. On judgment day, we no longer have to be afraid that our long list of selfishness is going to be read off proudly in front of God the Father. Instead, we plead the blood of Jesus, the one person who walked this earth fully human and yet never sinned, the one person in all of creation who deserves, actually deserves to judge us, will refuse He already paid that price. He paid it gladly. He paid that price so that you don't have to. He will be silent when we're laid bare, most vulnerable before God. It will be like when an angry mob surrounded the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember this story in John 8? A woman who broke the law and got caught. A woman who deserved technically, literally, to be stoned to death according to the law, God's law. And people asked Jesus what they should do to try to trap him. 
satisfy their own religious bloodlust, but instead of accusing and, and issuing judgments and, and siding with the law that God himself put into place, Jesus kind of ignores them. He is silent. Watch this. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Oh, this isn't hard to imagine, right? We've seen this throughout politics, our culture, all of people that try to trap each other into saying things they know will get them in trouble. And Jesus wasn't just battling two strong parties. He was battling four. The Pharisees were a religious, but also a political party and ideology. They were trying to trap him to get the crowd all riled up. And he was constantly being trapped. No, trying trapped. Our culture is trying to trap us right now. Even we as Christians know a little bit about this, right? And I don't see that getting any better in the near future. Anyways, as followers of Jesus, we also have to tap into the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit to answer questions that come at us. We have to learn how to recognize when someone is trying to trap us versus when someone is trying to learn from us. And can I just give you a hint? Nobody goes on social media to learn. Right? It matters what you say. This is what we're learning from Jesus. It matters what you say, but it also matters where and when you say it. We can see this in the case of God with Jesus in the garden. And we can see this in the case of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery too. Jesus knew they were trying to trap him. And so he created his own space for speaking. This is just genius. And it tickles me, the genius of God sometimes. Thank you. The genius of Jesus. He's so wise. And he didn't let them bully him into a quick answer. Now, our culture is all about quick answers right now, right? I mean, a celebrity dies, and literally they have articles about their entire life story that day. Like, how? How does that even happen? But we want those quick answers. We want it, it, it yesterday or before, if possible. And you're supposed to have your mind made up every second, every instant about everything. And if you don't, you're labeled ignorant and uneducated and irresponsible, <laughs> How dare you not know exactly where you stand on this issue? It's very much an issue. It's very but here we see from Jesus that being slow to speak is sometimes the wisest move you can make. Just imagine the scene for a second. It's a crowd, maybe this size, out in the streets. But instead of the usual hustle and bustle, the animals, the carts, the shops, the dust. I just close your eyes and think about the scene for a second. It's quiet. Because even the crowd recognizes this is a moment. Right? There's teachers of religious law out here. They're not usually out here. And there's Pharisees. And they're asking a guy who really didn't have any formal right to speak into this issue to speak. And so they listen carefully. Something's about to happen. What's he going to say? Is he going to condemn her, as the law says? And maybe create a riot that way? Or is he going to let her go and create a riot that way? Because that's heresy. What's going to happen here? Either answer would have gotten Jesus into trouble. But Jesus doesn't enter into it. He chooses not to feed the frenzy. And instead,
Oh, are you guys still here? Maybe I should, maybe I should say something. Uh, right? Like, what is that? What was he writing in the dust? I have to know. Like, that is my first question when I get to heaven. What were you writing? Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Feel the awkwardness in this? What were you writing? Jesus, everybody's staring at you. <laughs> like, what is happening? You almost want to shake him. Like, what, what are you? But it's genius. They kept demanding an answer. So finally, he stands up. And he says, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again. And he writes in the dust. He's not challenging, looking in their eyes, saying, come at me, bro. He stoops down again, and he lets it hang. He doesn't need to say another word, because what he just said was so perfect. He just lets it go. Silence. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away, one by one, beginning with the oldest, I never noticed before. The oldest, the wisest, the one who had sinned the most, was the first to see the wisdom in this. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And Jesus stands up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Neither do I. Even though I'm the only one. The only one in all of creation who deserves to go and sin no more. It matters what you say where you say it, and how you say it. Jesus geniusly created space. He didn't have to add more words to a problem. I think sometimes we just throw words at a problem until it goes away. Just keep talking about it. He didn't have to add more words to be heard. He created space. He created that pin drop moment purposefully simply out of doing something that wasn't expected. He didn't participate in the yelling and the the crazy mob mentality. He stepped out of it, and he drew them in along with him. Jesus called us to be like him, to follow that example. The problem is we're not usually Jesus in this story. If you can identify with anyone in this story, we're usually the mob, the bystanders, the crowd, the ones standing around watching someone else get judged, thrown under the bus, found out, the ones applauding someone else's misfortune because it makes us forget about our own mistakes for a moment. If they're looking at her, at least they're not looking at me. Or worse, we're the religious leaders in this story. The ones thinking we got it all together. We know more than Jesus himself. We follow all the laws. We go to church every Sunday. We read our Bibles and we pray. I mean, I got it all together. My kids know John 3.16. I don't know why that was the thing. (laughs) But we're the ones challenging the grace of God, the grace of God when it applies to other people. We're questioning, how could you love someone so messed up? Surely the roof will cave in when I walk into church, when that person walks into church. There's no way, right? We we think if, if we can just control our little world, just like the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, if we can just control our little world, if, if we can keep all the evil outside of it, We'll be safe. 
right, we'll go to heaven. We'll maintain our superiority. But we forget. But in this story, we're not the mob. We're not the religious leaders. We're the woman. Because you can't keep evil outside of the walls of your home. It's on the inside of your heart. We were each and every one of us born into a sinful fallen world with stuff, baggage, passed along generation to generation. We were born into it. It's on the inside. It's not out there. And that if not for Jesus... If not for the perfect lamb, on judgment day, our worst sins, the things we're most ashamed of, would be laid out one by one before God the Father, and he would judge us according to them. But Jesus. But Jesus. Jesus was complicit in his own injustice and simultaneously chose grace for us. He took the punishment and he dismissed ours. Even though we sleep on the job. Even though we're caught in the act of adultery. Even though... We constantly make selfish decisions. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. If this is the love that we get to experience, when God asks, like he asked Jesus to do something incredibly difficult in that garden. When God asks, it's not a chore. It's not too much. It's not cruel. He does have a plan, even when we can't see it, even when it's not comfortable, even when it's a long night, and even when he seems to be silent and far away, God has got this. He's got this. All we have to do is surrender. Surrender to Jesus. That's the quote. (laughs) That's the tweetable hashtag, the lifestyle motto, the the code to live by. Sacrifice short-lived comfort. Surrender to purpose. Start practicing physical proximity and spiritual proximity. Jesus isn't asking too much. Just surrender.